Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. Matthew 18, 10 to 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, there, there are angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, does he not leave the 99 on the hills to go look for the one that wandered off? If he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that that did not wander off. In the same way, your father is not willing that any of these little ones should perish.
I'm really enjoying this storyteller sermon series that we've been in for a while now. It, it, it brings the parables of Matthew to our weekly texts. And, and I especially appreciate the, the opening video where we have kids from Triumph who read the text, who read the parable from Matthew. Guinea Dahl did that for us today. Didn't he do a great job? And, and those videos of, of kids reading our text are especially appropriate for this text. This, this text is a parable about the lost sheep and, and the 99 who remain in the sheepfold. And what makes this particularly appropriate what makes it appropriate that, that Guinea read this text for us this, this time is that, that the context of this parable comes in, in a discussion about kids. It, it starts with, if we back up in context to the beginning of Matthew chapter 18, the, the disciples are asked ask Jesus, <clears throat> back to Matthew chapter 18, at the beginning, the disciples ask Jesus a question. They ask, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Who's, who's the greatest? Gospel writers Mark and Luke also tell us about this same story and and, and they give us a little bit more background and detail. They tell us that, that the disciples were actually talking about this and maybe even arguing a little bit about who was the greatest. And, and I don't know if they were all each pushing themselves like I'm the greatest or if they were saying, no, 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 not me, Peter, it must be you. And Peter might have said, no, 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 not me, John, it must be you. I, we don't know what the context was, but, but they come to Jesus with the question, Jesus, who's in the hall of fame in your kingdom? Who's, who's the greatest? Jesus, who is up for the Oscar, if you will? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus calls over a, a child a little child calls him over and he tells them, unless you receive the kingdom of God as a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of God. As if to say, forget about who's the greatest, you're not even in, unless you receive the kingdom like a little child, unless you become like a little child. That message doesn't necessarily play well in our culture. I would venture to guess none of us want it to be said that we were childish, right? Childish means to us, it, it, it sounds like immaturity, right? It sounds like, like someone who, who is, is a complainer or maybe somebody who doesn't really know much about how things are supposed to work. We don't want to be childish. But what Jesus is calling us to be is childlike. To be childlike means that, that I know I don't contribute to my own needs. I, a child is just a receiver. A child receives care from parents or grandparents, whoever the caregivers are, he, he or she is a receiver. Not focused on contributing. We are to be like children. We are to be childlike. We are to receive Jesus in childlike faith. That's the context of this parable. 
And so you heard at the very beginning of this text, you heard it, it begins with, do not despise one of these little ones. Don't despise one of them, not even one. That's how much God cares for the little ones among us, those who have received with childlike faith. That's, that's how much he cares. Don't despise even one of them, he says. And he says, don't despise one of them because their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. At the risk of digressing too far down a rabbit trail, this, this statement about their angels often gets used as as a text when people talk about having a guardian angel. And it's appropriate for us to recognize that, that we are guarded by angels. That's true, the, the, the heavenly host is, is, is there for us and protecting us. But, but if by a guardian angel, we think that God loves us so much that he takes one angel and says, okay, this is an angel for Tony. Tony, this angel will take care of you. They'll let me know if you need anything. If, if that's our idea of a guardian angel, <clears throat> that a guardian angel is God's way to offload his responsibility to look out for us to, to an, an, an angel, we're, we're missing the point. This statement says they're angels. The reality is that we are looked after by the God of angel armies. If we need an army of angels for our protection, they are at his disposal. He looks out for us. He doesn't offload his responsibility to look out for us to an angel, hoping that if, if I ever need anything, the angel will report to me and then I'll, be on, then I'll be on duty. No, no, God himself looks after us. God himself looks after you. And the armies of heaven are at his disposal on your behalf. That's how much he cares for you. That's how much he cares for the little ones. That's how much he cares for the ones who receive him in childlike faith. And then we get to the parable. With that as context, we get to the parable of the one and the 99. The parable of the lost sheep. He begins this parable with a question. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, won't he leave the 99 in the mountains and go search for the one that went astray? Jesus doesn't ask this question of his disciples because because he wants to know the answer. He asks it as a rhetorical question. That's the tone, that's the way it is set up. Wouldn't he, wouldn't he leave and go find the one? It's kind of a, a, a well, duh kind of statement. Of course the shepherd would go to find the lost sheep. Any reasonable shepherd would go to find the lost sheep. In the past several weeks, we've looked at parables of the kingdom that come from Matthew chapter 13. And oftentimes in those parables, we see something that is counterintuitive. We see a farmer who, who scatters seed in places where it's not likely to grow. We see 
a farmer who lets weeds grow among the wheat all the way until harvest and doesn't do anything about it. We see things that we go, wow, that's different. This isn't that. This is like, well, of course he's gonna go look for the lost sheep. What else would he do? Right, it's a rhetorical question and, and, and it does indicate how much he cares for us. Of course, you, you, you recognize that, that we're the sheep in this parable, right? He's called the child over to him. Receive the kingdom like this little child. Become a receiver of the kingdom like this little child is. A receiver of all the care that he or she needs we, we are the sheep. Those who have received Christ in childlike faith. Right? And, and, and Jesus leaves the 99 to go search for the one. That's how much he cares for you and I. That's how much he cares for his little ones. He drops everything to go find the lost one, the one who went astray. So what if, as you are seeing this today, what if you're not wandering astray? What if you're one of the 99? Do, do you ever wonder about the 99? Does it, does it ever seem to you like, was he just ignore them? Just abandon them to go look for one? Isn't 99 more important than one? Why, why would he leave the 99? Why would he do that? Well, the reality is he doesn't just abandon the 99. He leaves them up in the mountains. He leaves them together there in a mountain pasture. Perhaps part of it is that he knows the God of angel armies looks after them. But even more than that, if you know anything about sheep, sheep are safest in the midst of the flock. As I was growing up, we raised sheep. It was my dad, rather than give us a, an allowance or pay us for our work, gave us feed for our sheep. My brothers and I owned some sheep and that's, that was our only income as, as we were growing up. And, and it was wonderful, but it, it taught me a little bit about sheep and sheep by their nature are herding animals. Sheep operate in a herd or in a flock. That's the design. That's, that's how they maintain their own safety. Uh, one sheep off by itself is the most likely victim of any kind of predator. Whether it's a thief or a wild animal or some other form of malady, the sheep are safest when they're in the flock, in the midst of the flock. We're like that. As the sheep of the good shepherd, as the flock of the good shepherd, it's, it's designed in us that we thrive in the midst of the flock. 
Is it possible for somebody to come to the Lord to, in childlike faith to receive the gift of salvation, to be a Christian and to be a hermit living up all by themselves? Of course it is. But there's a reason why the writer of scripture tells us to not give up meeting together because we're designed to thrive in the midst of the flock. And if you're a part of the 99, as you watch this, if, if you're a part of, of the kingdom of God, if you're a part of the family of God, part of the design is that we exist and we thrive in the midst of the flock, where other sheep are caring for our safety and providing us security and giving us a, a, a place to belong and a place to be secure. And if you're part of the 99, you're not only designed to, to be a part of that and for others to look out for you, but you are designed to be a part of the flock that looks out for others. The shepherd doesn't abandon the 99, each for their own devices. No, he intentionally leaves them as a flock, as a herd, to go and seek and to save the one that's gone astray, to bring that one too in to the, to the flock. If you're one of the 99, you're not only designed to thrive within the context of the flock. But I also ask you, don't forget that you too, without the seeking and saving work of the good shepherd, you too would be the one who is astray. that you, aren't, you wouldn't be a part of the 99. You wouldn't be a part of the flock if, if the seeking and saving grace of Jesus Christ had not found you. If you had not received that by childlike faith because he came and found you, if apart from that, you wouldn't be a part of the 99. So we ought not scoff at or wonder about or, or feel somehow put off by the fact that he leaves the 99 because he left heaven itself to come and find you, to come and find me. He seeks after me and invites me to be a part of his flock. And if today you're the one, if today you have a sense that you're that sheep who has gone astray, you're not a part of the flock. You're, you're, not, you're not trusting in Jesus. Maybe, maybe you're here seeing this today and and you're not even sure you want to be a part of the flock. If you're the lost sheep, I want you to know that the good shepherd seeks you. That the good shepherd calls to you and invites you to receive his gift of grace and mercy, his gift of forgiveness and salvation. He calls to you and invites you to receive that with a childlike faith, a simple faith. He seeks you because he cares about you. You see, he is 
the good shepherd. He, he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Who, who laid down his life for the lost sheep. Who laid down his life for the one who has gone astray. To bring them back into the fold. Because as Jesus says at the end of this parable, because it's not his will that any should perish. It's not his will that any of his sheep the one who is astray or the 99, he is not willing that any should perish. That's good news this morning, sheep. Let's pray. Father, we thank you we thank you for the seeking and the saving work of the Good Shepherd. We thank you that you value and care for us. Whether we're a part of your flock or whether we're astray, that you care for us enough that you laid down your life for us. Lord, would you help us receive that in childlike faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Doug, and I want to take a minute and, and say thank you for watching the worship service today. If you'd like to extend your time of worship, we have a couple links to worship songs that fit today's message in the description down below. And simply click and you can spend more time uh, with Jesus in your day today. I have three quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and it'll only take a minute. First, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd be willing, you, you can visit our website at triumphlbc.org connect and let us know how we can reach you. Or you can visit triumphlbc.org events to find an activity that you could jump into. Second, we hope that you see this content as a supplement to your walk with Jesus. Our digital content really isn't designed to replace belonging and engaging with a gospel community. So whether that's here at Triumph or at another church, we invite you to find a community that you can connect with. And third, we invest a lot of resources into producing content that's used to bless people just like you all over our community. If this or any of the other resources we have here at Triumph have blessed you, would, would you consider giving? It's because of your generosity that we are able to continue creating and serving online.